Hey, greetings, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, thanks for uh, hopping on and checking us out here on Salt City Grind, my podcast. Uh, today, I'm, in, I'm, I'm joined by two people whose names I've, I've usually used when they're not in the room. We're usually talking about them uh, as, as reference points as we've been on this journey in Syracuse to develop a lead ordinance. We're often talking about um, the work of, of uh, Katrina Korfmacher and Elizabeth McDade, uh, respectively with the University of Rochester and the Coalition to Prevent Lead Poisoning in Rochester. Uh, thank you both for taking the time to talk to us. Happy to be here. Yeah. Great. So um, perhaps, you know, I know Katrina has to run early, so we'll start, we'll start with uh, some questions for Katrina. Um, maybe tell us about, um, you know, what how how the university got involved and and you know what your role was and and at what point you got involved and, and some of those broad strokes about you know your participation in the efforts and lead poisoning in in Rochester oh well that's going back quite a few years like nearly 20 um but it, I think the story goes back much farther than that because the University of Rochester's toxicology department has studied lead and the effects of lead on children's health for decades. Um, you know, we've had one of the longest running toxicology programs in the country and an NIEHS, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences Center for 45 years. And one of the real specialties of the researchers here is on heavy metals and particularly lead. And one um, study that was still sort of going on when I first moved here was the Rochester Lead and Dust Study where they followed kids um, who lived in, in the city and took their blood lead and then measured the lead and dust on the floors in their homes. And one of the things that they found was that you could directly predict like a linear relationship between the amount of lead on a child's living room floor and the amount of lead in their blood. And then they could also connect that directly to a loss of IQ and the children's ability to learn. So um, that was a really important um, finding and it was and it really resonated for people in the community because that was research done here and of course it relates to children everywhere in the country um, and in fact the EPA used that data to help establish the level standards that we have now for the amount of lead that is allowable in dust. Um, so that was one really important finding is that kids get lead from their houses and that makes it hard for them to do well in school. And since there were a lot of kids in Rochester who were not doing well in school, that really resonated locally. And then the other thing that they were finding was that there's no safe level of lead. So I think that especially because levels of lead in the whole population had come down so much by that time, like people Elizabeth and my age, we had over a 90% chance of having what would be considered really dangerous levels of lead. Now, wow. people our age have maybe 10% chance, right? That's a huge public health success. Um, but what researchers in our department were finding was that even well below those levels, which was then 10 micrograms per deciliter, they were finding effects of lead. So um, that research really drove the university and healthcare providers' involvement in the issue. And then when the community started making a connection between that research and the effects on children's ability to learn, children's lives, their long-term health effects, and criminal justice, you know, their uh, likelihood of being involved in crime later in life, um, they made that connection and said, wow, lead is a big problem. And if kids in our community have lead, we got to do something about it. So when you talk about the reduction, you know, someone uh, from a, a few generations ahead of me to my generation, that that drop of 90% to 10% or whatever, you know, that that great drop between generations, was that due to awareness? What caused the drop that was just societal between someone who, who was, you know, 20 or 30 years older than me to, to, to myself? Well, that's an easy one. We took lead out of paint and gasoline, right? So having... Right led into paint um, in the early 1900s and then into gasoline uh, in the early 1900s as well was a really effective way of spreading it throughout our environment and ways to make sure that all of us get exposed to it in urban areas, uh, particularly where a, a lot of it was used for anybody living near roadways, you know, they were getting exposed to it all the time. Once we took lead out of gasoline and paint, the population-wide levels came way, way down. But we still left a lot of lead in our environment, in the paint that was already on those houses and the dirt that had already accumulated around roads. So kids who live in houses 
where that paint is continuing to, to get ground into the dust, they continue to get exposed to it. Whereas kids who live in houses where that paint's been completely replaced or um, is really well maintained, they aren't. And so that's why we always say that lead transformed itself from a public health problem to an environmental justice problem. Mm. And, you know, just, uh, you know, all of the houses, we all live in housing that was built before 1978. And if you actually look at the levels of elevated blood levels across New York State, it follows the area now. You know, so looking at where, where were the oldest communities established. And, um, you know, if, if, if you grew up in a, in a house, our beautiful houses that we have in these in our communities, um, you know, chances are they were painted with lead paint at some point. Even if they weren't in the last go round, this is where when they first got built, they were. Right. So, uh, could you, what, what data did the university collect throughout this time period? So you said it's been now 20 years that the University of Rochester has been involved in this, in this, um, this effort to, to reduce uh, lead exposure and, and, and uh, increase prevention. What kind of data was, was the university involved in and what, you know, what, what did you guys find from that data? Hmm. Well, um, like any large organization, there are lots of parts of the university, right? So I was talking a little about GLOW. Okay. That wasn't really the university, but um, a partner. It was you. The point yeah. is. Yeah, any, any data. It doesn't have to necessarily be the university, but your role in this, like what, what data have you, you know, have you collected or has been collected in Rochester uh, throughout this process? And, you know, any insights you have from the data, um, you know, that the, that, that we might uh, benefit from, you know, knowing here in Syracuse as we begin this kind of journey. Sure. So, um, as I said, we had this sort of unique resource of toxicologists who study lead's effects and, and had done some epidemiological work in the, in the community. Um, but we also had a lot of healthcare providers who work and take care of, of um, patients, take care of kids, do a lot of blood lead testing. And that data, of course, goes to the health department, just like it does in Onondaga County. Um, so constantly analyzing that, I wouldn't say it's research so much as analysis and trying to make sense of that public health data that's existing. And then to connect it to the housing data that the city already has. Um, so there wasn't a lot of original research in terms of, you know, advancing medical science that happened after that point, because we know that lead is bad for kids. We didn't need to reinvent the wheel and show um, yet again that lead was bad for kids. Um, but what we did want to show is whether and how the lead law was working. So, um, as Elizabeth said, going into um, one thing that we did do before the lead law passed is um, even when you know that lead is bad for kids and that it's the same everywhere, people want to see what it looked like in their community. So we did a really small study that looked for lead hazards in just about 100 houses that were home to patients, um, babies and, and young children who went to a particular community health clinic. And they found lead hazards in 97% of those houses. So that was, um, I think, you know, really helpful to people to say, not only is this a problem everywhere, and yes, it's a problem here, but even when we um, give those families the best resources that exist now, they can't solve that problem. So we found that many of those houses had already been cited for violations. Many of those parents knew that lead was a problem. They cleaned well. It wasn't something they could just take care of themselves. So that study really showed us that we needed a new policy change. And then following up on that, we knew that we wanted to, to track how many of the houses that we inspected still had lead hazards because that was going to really let us know whether the the lead law was working or not. You know, eventually we'd like to see the, the numbers of kids with lead, lead levels coming down. But the first thing we wanted to see is whether those houses were getting safer. So the city actually collected and publicized that data every year. And that was even written into our lead law is that they have to do that every year. And that's how we can check from the outside to make sure that that's still working. Mm. And, and so what what did you find from the data did you do you have any um off the top of your head um a, any data points that show that since the implementation of of the ordinance um you have seen a, a, a great reduction you know i know that the 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 rep the number that i always referenced that you know was kind of a guiding light as we were trying to develop this legislation was that rochester had a 90 percent reduction um, in levels over the course of the decade or something like that. Um, 
But what, what did you do? Right, so, no, shaking your head no. Was that not an accurate data or data point? So, it wasn't quite 90%, but I'd like to go back a little bit to uh, talking about kind of circling back to your question, Joe. Um, so what the GLOW project was, and Katrina actually worked on it, I'm just telling the story about it, was a collaboration between the county and the, and the University of Rochester and Action for a Better Community, correct? Am I missing some of the people that were part of it? Okay. And the community health clinic and, and, the, and the neighborhood volunteer and the um, block club, the local right. community right. organizations. So this was connected, the, the community health center was connected to a, an elementary school that had a, a large number of children with elevated blood levels. Um, and so this study was looking at the homes around where this uh, population of children with elevated blood levels was to be able to, A, as Katrina was saying, document that it was the housing that was the issue. Um, but then also, importantly, when you're looking at this idea of collecting data and trying to figure out how to utilize it or be able to paint a picture so that um, policies and procedures can be changed, they also collected information about the fact that it wasn't that expensive to actually make these homes safer. And so, you know, there was all of this clamoring going on that, you know, somehow the housing market was going to fail and nobody could afford to fix them and so forth. And so, you know, it became a conversation, not necessarily a full on abatement, which is one way of doing it, but also what are interim controls that go into it? So how do you actually make the home safe? Interim controls, of course, include the fact that you have to be vigilant about it. You know, you can't just do it and leave. Um, but the study that Katrina worked on with all of these community partners really was uh, the data that was utilized to help shore up the argument against uh, the, the anybody who was naysaying the lead ordinance. And it was actually an incredibly useful tool and a process and a set of data that really did help inform that, that legislation. Mm. And so what, what was some of the data that was collected in that that helped push back on, on the narrative? Uh, what, what you were saying particularly the the uh, the fears that and I know that's something that you know we've had here in Syracuse as well. People scared that the housing market is going to crash, and maybe maybe I don't know if if you both want to touch on that about some of the fears that were you know fears that were stated beforehand and and the data that you know was collected that that kind of showed those fears to not be uh, realized or you know I I I've, I've gotten that impression if I'm if I've gotten it wrong let me know but um, I, I fear that there was a lot of fear beforehand and, and there was data that showed that that fear was relatively unfounded when when the ordinance was implemented correct Completely. <laughs> you were asking about the data and first of all your lead rates have come down too yes um, but ours have come down two and a half times faster and we know that from st the states collecting the same um, blood lead surveillance data that you collect the same way across the state. So every lead levels are coming down everywhere, right? As the soil gets covered up, as old houses get taken down. But the fact that our lead rates have come down so much faster than yours, when otherwise things are pretty similar in our cities, right? We both had a foreclosure crisis. We've both been struggling economically. We both have lots of old housing and poor conditions. So the main difference is we have a lead law and a coalition that bird dogs it and a great staff that implements it, right? And you're going to have that too. So you're going to catch up to us real, real soon. Um, so that's one, one thing that I think is really important to keep an eye on. But in between, as Elizabeth said, there are things you can watch. So um, the what we learned from GLOW, that small study, was really, really wrong. And that is, I hate being wrong, but I love being wrong in this case. Yeah, yeah. When um, I said that we found lead hazards in 97% of the houses, I expected when we started implementing the lead law that 97% of the houses were going to fail, right? Because that's right. And glow. And yes, it was some of the highest risk housing. So I thought maybe, you know, 90%. Um, you want to guess how many failed? About five, five percent. Wow. Completely flip the odds. And some people say, oh, that shows you don't need a lead law because all the law, the, um, the houses are passing, but it's exactly the opposite. We know that the property owners said, even before the, the law passed, gosh, lead is a big problem. I don't want to be poisoning children. And oh, the city's going to be enforcing something, so I don't want to have to suddenly, you know, come up with money to fix all of my housing at once. So they started fixing the housing, 
Um, and by the time they got and the end, then the city took time to educate them about what they needed to do to fix the housing. And by the time they got inspected, they'd done it already. So whereas we were finding, if we had just gone in and inspected those houses in GLOW two years before the lead law passed, only less than 5% of them would have passed. By the time they started implementing it, only 5% of them failed. So that's where we're really wrong. And I think that shows, you know, really powerfully shows the impact of the law. And then the other one um, where we were wrong, really wrong was the, the cost. So um, landlords were saying, you know, it's going to cost $30,000 to fix these houses because the only model they knew then was from HUD lead hazard control grants, which especially at that time poured lots and lots money into each house to get all the lead out and replace all the components that had any lead on them. That's a really expensive way. And Elizabeth said it's, it's not necessary if you're maintaining a property well. So at the time um, we were doing estimates that had come down to around $15,000 a house. But when we looked at GLOW and talked about what it would take to fix those houses up, it was like $3,300 without windows and about $5,500 with windows. Um, so a lot lower than um, the landlords were afraid, right? And, you know, I don't blame them for being afraid because I've been in a lot of those glow houses that were not worth $15,000 if you wanted to buy them in cold cash. Right, right. Um, you know, one of the first risk assessment I remember, remember doing, the property owner looked at it, turned to the set, tenant and said, you want to buy it for 12000 Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, that was pretty powerful, but uh, it turned out that, you know, those estimates were much lower than expected. But then when we came back after the law was implemented and we surveyed landlords about how much it actually cost them to repair them, the estimates were actually even lower than that. The highest estimates for the lowest value housing. So you can imagine that a house that's valued at $20,000 probably has a lot of problems with it. So it probably does need more work to be done to come up to that standard. It was around 1200 but most people were finding less than $400. Mm. It was much less expensive than we thought based on GLOW. Yeah. And that survey was done by a third, an independent third party that you know and that's one of the that, that's one of the ways that we've been able to make sure that you know when we're doing these types of studies um we're making sure that it's not just us doing it that there's that it's being verified by a, an independent third party and um there was a, a study done before the letter ordinance went in and then one year after it and um that's where the landlords were surveyed and, and in fact Landlord's uh, satisfaction, if I remember correctly, was pretty high out of all of that, that their fears were really completely unbounded, um, that they've gotten information that they needed, that they've gotten resources that they needed, and, and you know, the, the blood level levels were actually proving that what we were saying was true. Mm. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you touched on something there that's that's been one of the biggest... Um, you know, when people ask, you know, one, one of the stories that always resonates with me is as uh, Paul Chiavari, who's done a lot of work in the Syracuse area on lead, he said he went around canvassing and people are saying, like, lead's still a problem? Like, I thought that was done in the 90s, you know? Like, I thought we finished that, you know? And a lot of people are always kind of stumped that, like, why does, you know, why does this problem persist? And I think a lot of it is what you just talked about, where landlords are terrified of it because... Um, you know, getting hit with thirty thousand dollars, forty thousand um, dollars, but as you've illustrated, that was kind of a, a really revolutionary moment for me in trying to fix it. You know, at first I got crestfallen when I found out it was going to be thirty, forty thousand per property to fix it. But then when I spoke to some of the people, like you know, studied some of your guys' efforts and and from Gary Kirkmeyer, that the the numbers were in the low thousands to to at least you know. Um, so maybe we could talk about. Um, Katrina, in your studies, and, and Elizabeth, if you want to address this one as well, something else that we really talked about, which I think people don't realize, is the economic multiplier factor of lead. You know, because as I always think of it as like a stitch in time saves nine with, you know, with as far as, you know, all the things that are, you know, if, if we deal with this one problem at the root, we don't have to deal with educational health, um, you know, all the other multitude of, of problems that arise afterwards. So I didn't know, Katrina, if you had if you had come across that on that or could speak to that a bit, and maybe Elizabeth could as well. Um, 
that that kind of aspect of it because obviously it's something I've been you know banging the drum on but it, it would be interesting to hear your guys thoughts on how it has a multiplier effect when you deal with it yeah one of the um, the frustrating things about trying to figure out what the multiplier effect is is that that national estimates um, showed so clearly that it's worth a lot of money to prevent lead poisoning because the benefits in terms of long-term costs are so huge. But those benefits are in terms of lost future income. So if you figure out for every kid who gets exposed to a little bit of lead, the small small drop or large, depending on how much um, they're affected, in their IQ, economists have models that show if you have a lower IQ, you will earn less over your lifetime. And if you take out up all those little bits of for all every single child and you add them up together for their whole lifetime, it turns out to be an enormous number. And they stop there. Now, no offense, but you have yeah. to you have to balance your budget next year. Do you care about the fact that if you in you know ruin your housing market or something you know drastic happens now and you're up for election next year, um, the fact that you saved the the society, right? These kids could move all over the U.S. and you've saved a hundred billion dollars over their lifetime. That doesn't help you in Syracuse today. So um, the coalition, the very first thing they asked me to do is try to figure out how much we were going to save, but to put aside that those big giant numbers of IQ and look at more immediate costs in terms of um, medical costs that happen in the near term, in terms of special education that kids are likely to look, need over the next 12 years, um, in terms of criminal justice, so their reduced likelihood of be, being involved as youth offenders and, and having um, interactions with the law. And um, in those categories particularly, we still found that you'd be saving millions of dollars each year really soon. So those kinds of estimates were, they were meaningful because people understood that. And then I think that people have started getting a better sense also of the health effects that um, probably the biggest effect of lead that we don't even talk about that much is, is increasing um, hypertension and a chance of having a heart attack later in life. And that just increases everybody's odds a little bit, but because it's everybody's, it adds up to a huge amount down the road. Um, so we talk about the media effects on education, on um, families' lives, on behavior, on criminal justice, but in terms of the big societal picture, there are huge costs in terms of long-term health effects and long-term earning for individuals. And to, you know, to, to further illustrate that, you know, there's also correlations between exposure to lead hazards and kidney damage. So when you start looking at, if we're looking at in particular hypertension, right, high blood pressure and kidney damage, you know, are we seeing uh, issues within the same communities where we're finding these uh, these uh, dilapidated homes or we're, we're finding uh, high levels of blood? Are we also seeing people experiencing those same health concerns? You know, are we seeing these correlations? And I know there's no direct line and I know you can't actually go like that, but there's a lot of there's a lot of connection between all of that, right? There's a lot of ripple effect that comes from being able to take this one thing off the plate and and reducing the effort or the, reducing the impact further down the road. Yeah, so I, I, I often take um, some of the some of the live comments that are coming in on Facebook, but I, I also try to just pay attention to what we're talking about. But I did see in the corner of my eye that someone commented, um, "Is it coming from lead pipes?" or from, um, you know, lead paint. Um, and, and I think, I know in Syracuse, the case is, you know, something like 98 or 99% of the, the cases that come into the hospitals are are the lead paint, um, that it is the housing, that is the culprit. Um, so I wanted to ask you guys about that. And also something that, I, I, as you were talking, I started thinking about, about the health impacts. Um, you know, so often as we talk about lead, we talk about, you know, children six and under who are the, who are obviously the ones most affected as their brains are still developing. Um, but do we see, have there been a lot of um, research in, in your guys' experience on, you know, for example, middle-aged people or, or elderly people uh, ingesting later in life and, and how that might affect health? Um, any, any thoughts on those two topics? Do you mean them getting exposed when they're adults? Yeah. Well, oh, okay. Yeah. You, know, we, you see really 
most of the health effects that are really expensive, like we think immediately about a child's ability to learn. That's something we can understand. But actually, in terms of cost, the effects on their cardiovascular system, on um, dementia and aging, you know, their neurological system, um, on, on their bones, osteoporosis, um, all those things that you see later in life are often connected to having been exposed to high levels of lead when those people were children. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody your age, if you decide to go and paint your house and you get out the Black & Decker and you start um, sanding the house down and there's lead paint there and you breathe in the lead dust, um, yes, you will get exposed to lead. Your blood lead level will go up and you may have symptoms too. You might um, lose your sense of smell. You might start getting re really irritable. You could have stomach problems. You could even you know, go into coma and die if you get high enough levels. But it takes a lot more lead exposure to cause those kinds of symptoms for an adult than for a child. It just takes tiny, tiny amounts to affect a child. Um, so it will also affect sexual dysfunction, which is the thing that adults always pay attention to. And there are potential correlations between lead poisoning and dementia. Um, and one of the things that actually was um, a couple of years ago here in Rochester, there were two contractors who were in the hospital and their elevated blood levels were in the 200. Um, they had lead poisoned themselves. One guy lead poisoned his wife as well by doing home renovation work. Um, and they were, you know, they've either been using a heat gun or something to make it really vaporize and make it really, uh, 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 you know, doing its job at poisoning them. In fact, one of the guys uh, checked himself out of the hospital against medical advice, and they actually think that he was cognitively impaired from the exposure to lead because he just he just left, and he you know he could because he's an adult. But there are there are all kinds of effects with this type of thing, and yes, it's not as direct as as what as what Katrina was saying, and it isn't about necessarily about immediate brain damage you know, with children. It actually. Um, uh, uh, Destro destroys the decision or impacts the decision-making center, and it can impact auditory processing. So children have difficulty even hearing what's going on in the classroom and processing it. So you really can be looking at some long-term health impacts with that. But adults are not immune, and and to somehow pretend that that's true, uh, people people need to. You know, I I've done a lot of education outreach to RRP classes, and by the time I finish, you know, I ask everybody working there, I'm like, you guys are working in this field. Do you get blood work done? And when you go to your, your primary care physician, and do you include lead in that? And none of them ever do. And by the end of the class, they're all doing, they're all going to do it the next time because you need to know, you know, you can't, I mean, not knowing doesn't make the problem go away. And it's super important to make sure that just because we don't think we have a problem doesn't mean there isn't a problem. Right. So, Katrina, I know I know you had to run. Um, you know, we said we, we'd have you on for the first half of the episode, and you had to uh, you had some obligations you had to get to in a little bit. So, just before you leave, um, uh, and then I'll, I'll focus on Elizabeth and the coalition and the work that they've done. But before you leave, is there um, is there any um, maybe moments that thoughts that stand out to you as as Syracuse begins to to look uh, to implement this legislation and moving forward you know I, I always feel like um, you know for me having someone who has been down the path whatever it is in my life you know someone who who has uh, you know someone with with a few years experience can often give you insights that you would have had to learn a much harder way. Uh, through trial and error uh, again and again, you know. Um, are there any things that you think that, you know, you guys had trial and error that you could um, give, a, you know, things that come to mind that, oh, when, as Syracuse looks to try to implement this or, or do this, um, things we should look out for or considerations, you know, any anything that stands out to you that, that you think would be relevant for us to know as, as we try to, uh, you know, implement this ordinance and, and work on lead prevention in our community. Yeah, well, this is when it gets interesting, right? <laughs> I know for you, it's been a huge amount of effort building up to this point, and I really want to thank you for all your work and, and um, congratulate you for your perseverance in moving this, because even though for us it was a big unknown, we already had an inspection system in place, and um, we had a mayor who is, you know, also committed, like yours is, to, to making a change here. 
Um, but once you start trying to implement that change, that's when that's when the hard work starts. So um, I just encourage you to you know remember all the reasons you did this in the first place, and then keep that alive. And I'm glad that Elizabeth is going to stay on because she is really the expert in keeping that flame alive. You know, I think that um, and I'm going to talk about how awesome you are, Katrina, since you hate I, doing it yourself. <laughs> then I'll click off. You do that, I'll click off. But I, but um, so Joe, congratulations on receiving one of the Lead Coalition's annual awards for your work down the road, um, and the fact that the coalition. Um, thanks and appreciates everybody in government. They give all awards to landlords, to people in the county, to people in the city, to community activists, to individual parents. Everybody has a part to play in this. And I think that, um, you know, one thing that we did before the lead law passed and, you know, is something you might want to think about after you're, when you're starting to think about implementation is having a community led summit where it just can't, Passing that law, that's not enough. That, that's not going to do it. That is one tiny piece of the puzzle. What we have here is a system, and every single person, no matter what role they have, um, has, a, has a, an important part to play in changing that system. So at our lead summit, we had the mayor and the county executives stand up and say, look, we're from different parties. We don't agree on much, but this one we agree on, and we're going to do the right. same thing. He had community group leaders saying, look, our communities are facing a lot of challenges. What's in the paint may seem like it's low down on the totem pole, but we get that this affects our children's future, and we're going to do that. Parents came forth and said, you know, testing for lead makes my kid cry, but I'm going to do that. And the faith leaders from all the different congregations said, we disagree about a lot of stuff about what God looks like and how, you know, how to, to um you know, about our faith, but we all agree that children should go forth in life with what they were given. And so they preached from the, you know, whatever to their congregations um, about the importance of lead. So that kind of, of making sure that everybody sees how it relates to their interests and sustaining that going forward, that's, I think, the most important thing. And, and it is really difficult. So you're going to be the teachers now, right? You're going to be teaching somebody down the road. And I think that, um, to the extent that you you can do that and show the progress, um, you're going to make it that much easier for the next city. Awesome. Well, thank you, Virginia, for taking the time with us. We appreciate you. And like Elizabeth said, we all sing your praises, even if you don't want to. Thank you so much for thank all you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for what you're doing. Bye. Bye. Great. Uh, I, I love. It's so great to talk to both of you. I'm really so happy. So, Elizabeth, tell us. Like I said, so we I, I would have just gone back and forth all episode, but uh, you know we front loaded it with Katrina, and now maybe you could tell us about the coalition and some of the work you guys did, and um, you know how you how it started. You know, give us some of the history of the coalition and and how you guys have interacted with lead prevention in Rochester. Um, uh, and you know, Joe, I, I want to echo what, what Katrina has been saying, you know, we are super supportive of what everybody is doing in Syracuse and, you know, we'll continue to be a resource and be as useful as we might be in, in your process. And it's very exciting. Congratulations. Thank so, you. um, as part of that, that GLOW project that, that Katrina worked on and that some of the county health department worked on, that was connected to school number 17, which is where Ralph Spezia was the principal. And Ralph was one of the founding members of the coalition. And at the time, so Ralph overheard, he was the principal, he overheard the school nurses talking about a, the, a vast majority of the kids in his school who had elevated blood levels. And he was like, what's that? And because Rochester is the largest small town you'll ever live in, as I'm sure Syracuse is as well, um, it turned out that our, our health director at the time was a former pediatrician at uh, Anthony Jordan Health Center, uh, Andy Doniger, who was awesome, and I believe he and, and Ralph knew each other or they had a relationship where they could be called and ask what was going on. At the same time, um, uh, Mel Callen, who is our current uh, board chair and is a family nurse practitioner, was also on the staff of then, she, she was the chief of staff of then uh, Senator Rick Dollinger. Um, so, uh, in trying to get the people together who were expert in all of this, and certainly, of course, you know, the um, uh, University of Rochester with Katrina was already there, public health department was already there, the city already had an inspection process in there. It was getting all these people together, and we, we can't underestimate um, the, the importance of Empire Justice as well. Um, we had some great uh, uh, attorneys, uh, Brian Hetherington and, um, um, and 
Uh, I'm blanking right now. I'm so embarrassed. Um, Katrina will kill me later on. It'll come to me, Mike Hanley. And, uh, uh, and then of course the community members, you know, where we really had a lot of people who understood what was going on, who were really, really committed to understanding what were the tools that our community had to be able to do this. So the coalition started meeting and one of the strengths of it was that, you know, everybody brought to bear something, right? They had their own strengths that they brought. It was like a stone soup. And, and then it really became about this idea of how do you begin to identify where you can make change? You know, you need to do, you need to do an evaluation of what you've already got because you've got to build upon already existing successes because the truth is you're probably already doing some great stuff, right? It's not like you're starting from a, a, a blank slate and build upon that and then see where they can connect. So, um, you know, I will say, and I always say this, and I would say this if our community partners are here, you know, the county health department and the city of Rochester, all those people had to be dragged to those community meetings in the first place. Not because they didn't believe in what we were doing, because they were busy already, right? right. Is that community groups going to tell us what to do? Really? Um, and uh, I actually take it as enormous praise that uh, Gary Kirkmeyer said at our annual meeting last year that, you know, he's still coming to, an to monthly meetings every year you know, for 12 years. And I said, but you're still coming, you know, um, and that speaks to the fact and, and you know, what Katrina uh, alluded to in that idea of the community summit. And again, in some ways, some, and this all predates my involvement with the coalition, so I can really just sing their praises really speaks to the the strategy that um, the organizers were looking at this idea of creating a, you know getting some getting some funding they, they were working with United Way as well and United Way actually was one of the funders for the lead summit they brought in uh, experts from across the nation as well as local experts and it had a, a two days of panels at least a whole day but they got the the count the county um, executive and the city mayor and they were uh, our county has been Republican and our city has been Democratic and they have had a traditionally very combative relationship. And, uh, but on this one thing, they couldn't, they couldn't not agree. And so we actually, you know, took, you know, they both committed to doing something. They had to did it in public in front of all of these witnesses and we got tape of it. We had pictures of it. And so we used that as a catalyst, right. As a springboard to then inform the processes going forward, because so you've got the glow study, You've got the local data. You've got the third-party evaluation. You've got all these, you know, experts, national experts coming in and laying out this thing. I mean, there's really no room for argument in this, right? It's not. It's not that we need to prove what we know is true. We just need to figure out, looking at what we've got, how do we then begin to make a change? Because the problem with this situation is that once you know it's there, to not do something is a moral failing. Right. You know what I mean, because we know what it does. We got decades of that research. We know how to do something about it. And something about it can be as simple as literally, you know, it's not about doing everything all at once. You know, I, I talk to a lot of families. And so you can't frighten people, right? You, you've got to make sure people understand the, the difficulty and the importance of this. But if you paralyze them with fear, they're just going to do exactly that. They're not going to be able to respond. So if you're going to talk to somebody about the importance of making a behavior change, you have to give them some tools to be able to do that. Part of that is making sure, you know, you are talking to your healthcare provider about getting a lead test. You know, you can do something as simple as, and I know it's baby stuff. You can take your shoes off when you go in the house, right? You can wash your hands before you eat with soap and water, not hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer is for COVID. Soap and water is for lead, not hand sanitizer. So we got to have two different types of cleaners. You know, making sure you're wet cleaning. Um, all of these things can be very basic things. You know, if you had somebody come in and do a test in your home, if you, you know, I mean, in, in Rochester, you can pay somebody to come in with an XRF gun and test, you know, for a couple hundred bucks and test every painted surface in your home. And, you know, what that does is it gives you a blueprint, right? Like if it turns out that the kid's room is hot, but your room is not, switch bedrooms, right? Like that's a pretty simple thing. But if you don't know that and the kids are still in the bedroom where that's hot, you know, you're giving your you're you're exposing them when, when you don't need to. And, and I know I'm being simplified about this, but but the thing is there's a range of of ways to do this, right? And and also one of the strengths and really, you know, Gary laughing about the, the every 12 months, we keep meeting because we need to. You know, I mean, when you talk about a, a law that um, that is about interim controls, right? When you talk about interim control measures, 
that means you must be looking and making sure that interim controls are being followed and that they're, you know, you're following up. You can't just go and, you know, an interim control could be going back to the porch dust study could be putting down indoor outdoor carpeting on the porch. So you, you cover the painted wood and you, you, you know, you've, you've put an interim control in. Then the next tenant moves in and they hate indoor outdoor carpeting and they roll it up or it became, or it looks terrible. And so they roll it up. And so then, you've created a situation where the, the control is no longer in place, you know? So um, it's important to make sure that there's, that there's a process in place. Um, you know, the, the lead ordinance is a carrot and stick situation. Um, you know, you are fined if you, and you're not allowed to rent um, in compliance. And it's, you know, it's difficult, all of those things. I'm not saying it's a hundred percent on everything, but there's, 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 um, avenues for response you know and and uh the county for example the county and the city work together and i'm sure you're aware of this if a home if a, if a tenant is receiving a housing subsidy and that payment is going to the landlord if there's a lead hazard in that home and the city identifies it that they contact the county immediately and the county stops rent payment to the landlord until there is a third-party clearance to make sure that that home is safe because in Rochester now, the business model is you don't get to, you know, you don't get to rent a home that has lead hazards in it to a family with children. You know, you don't get to, and that's become how, I mean, it, it got rolled out, right? It's, it's been over time. Not everybody had, it didn't go from zero to 60, not everybody had to change overnight. But that has become the standard. And like Katrina was saying, that once we all knew that was going to be the standard, right, you set the standard. People meet it, you know, because they're business people and this is their business. You know, you don't you don't get to run a restaurant with a bubbling cauldron of biohazard or, you know, or rat feces and, and expect that you're going to be able to serve people because those things will make people sick. Yeah. So this is also, you know, not a direct matter, but it's a similar type of situation. No, that, that's funny. Once it becomes a practice. Everybody, everybody follows through. That's always the example I use when I talk to people. It's funny that you use that example because that's what I kept saying. It's like if you had a if you had a restaurant and you found they were cooking mercury in a pan, you know, or or you know some toxin that was that was evaporating in the kitchen, you know, that's why we have things. And at the same time, if you're a landlord, it's it's slightly different, but this is a service you are providing for people for a profit. And yeah. if if your product uh, creates brain damage and long term developmental problems in your you know, in your customer, that is precisely, you know, what we're supposed to be there for, you know, as, as government. So I, I had a couple of questions that came from, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people in, in Syracuse, you know, we've had a monthly meeting going for a couple of years here based on the, the readings that we had and, you know, the studies of Rochester that we had of the coalition. Um, and I was, you know, I was very active in that, but now that kind of the ordinance is being implemented i'm also kind of like drawing that you know the feedback i've gotten from people is it's kind of awkward to have a, a city councilor kind of as as one of the main you know and so uh i know that in reading about the coalition you know a lot of it you had were, were families who were affected uh by lead as you know as, as members of the coalition how have you um how have you maintained engagement and stuff like that? How have you, you know, how have you done outreach and, and kept it going all these years? You know, for, for me, a lot of times it's like people get fatigue and, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. That becomes one of the biggest obstacles in, in my experience. But you guys are going on, I don't know, how many years has the coalition been going now? Um, well, I've been involved since 2006. Right. So it, and it started around 2000. Um, so I... I was actually in city council when they passed the law in December of 2005 oh, okay. because I was working, I was a legislative aide to um, then city councilman Wade Norwood. Um, but I got involved after all of that. So, you know, a couple of things. Um, one, uh, you're right. We don't have any elected officials um, in, in a, in a, in a, in a, um, not managerial, but in a leadership role within the coalition. And, and part of that is because, uh, though they are part of the conversation and, you know, so the city and the county are all part of our committees, but they are not in leadership roles. Number one, because it would be, they can't be, right? Their jobs are, they can't do that. And number two, we wouldn't want to ask them to do that. 
Um, they serve as resources and people that we talk to all the time and that we connect with and that we also make sure that when we're making suggestions about things or how we want to do things, it's based upon what really needs to happen as opposed to, you know, in the ideal world, it should be this. And then you create something that's impossible to support because there's no mechanism to do so. So, you know, what we've been able to do is to make sure that we're moving forward in a good direction. You know, um, the organization has ebbed and flowed. There's no question about that. Um, and, you know, we used to have uh, monthly meetings with our, our coalition. We went to quarterly meetings. We Our executive committee still met. We had things. I'm sure there are some people who wish we were meeting every month because it would be nice to connect with people. You know, we also have some very dedicated people. I mean, you know, some people like Katrina have been involved for a very long time. People like Mel Callen. Um, Stan Schaefer, I mean, those people have been involved for a very long time. And, and even when people leave the coalition, they don't get to actually leave the coalition. Like I'm still, you know, uh, Brian Heatherin actually uh, um, retired from Empire Justice and he's somebody I'm still calling about different things and referring him to other communities and so forth to help with, with what they're doing. So, um, you know, what's important about this is really also not this idea of one and done, right? Like this this actually is a really great example if you allow it to grow of how a community can actually work with its electeds and with its policies and procedures it, it can be very nerdy but i will also say you know we call our friends in the county and the city and in in in, in those in in places we call them on the carpet when need be you know they will be the first to tell you that we will be like wait what and um and but we do that because we've actually created trusted relationships at this point. We don't necessarily do it in public, you know, um, and, and that's different. super important. You know, one of the things that I think is really, really important as you go forward with a coalition, or at least it's been something that's been crucial to how we've been able to do it, is egos have got to be like the last thing that's at, you know, that's even part of the conversation. And, you know, plenty of times we have allowed other people, you know, other other groups, other organizations, individuals to take the spotlight because it, it's it, it was the right thing to do to make things move forward. And um, and we've gotten plenty of accolades in, in time with that. You know, you have to be a grown up about this stuff. And, uh, you know, and, and also you can't be knee jerk. You know, we've had people coming in. I, I know people like the whole thing, when you know, when the heartbreak, the heartbreak of Flint happened. You know, there was a situation where there were um, some lovely children who wanted to take like a bus load full of bottled water to Flint and deliver it. And, and you know, they were doing, you know, lovely, lovely gesture and they wanted the coalition to be a part of that. And we were like, no, you know, I mean, that's just not a best practice. And um, it, 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 can, it can make people feel good. Um, but the truth is this work is based in data, evidence, evaluation, monitoring, data, evaluation, <laughs> and then, you know, rinse and repeat. I mean, it really is this ongoing process. But then the cool thing is because you've actually tested that, you can trust it, right? And it's much easier to be nuanced in how you have to change something because you've been able to figure out it's not 80 things that you need to do. There's 10 that really need some focus on this, you know, and the, these other things you've got to look at every two years as opposed to every year. And it, it's been, it's been really, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, I have to say this whole thing has been truly gratifying, you know, in a way that seems very nerdy. Um, but this idea of being able to get community members, electeds, health, all of these different people really trying hard to keep children safe, Oh my God, really? Of course. You know, no, we, I didn't mention the school district. They're part of it as well. I, I couldn't leave out the school district. Yeah, that was actually going to be my next question. So these, these questions come from some of the folks who are trying to get the, a coalition more established in Syracuse. And they wanted to know, um, you know, the direct effect uh, lead poisoning has on a student's growth and development. What role did the Rochester City School District and the superintendent play um, in the coalition? And you know what were those um, what were those partnerships like? Well, um, the uh, I don't remember the superintendent being involved, but again, remember I was 
post that. But I will tell you. Even later, yeah. That, you know, I mean, Ralph Spezio was a was a city school district uh, elementary school principal, and it was his work that got the whole thing, the whole ball of wax, you know, going and connected with the work that Katrina and other people were doing. Um, and uh, of course, at the at the time on city council. Uh, the city council member who really uh, was able to bring uh, the message to bear was Tim Maines, who is also a city school district principal. Um, so the city of Rochester, the school district, has had one of the first lead safe schools policies in the country and one of the few lead safe schools policy in the country. Um, we've always had representatives from, we currently have representatives from the environmental team at the city school district. So those are the people looking at the building maintenance and making sure everybody's you know, doing, if they're doing water testing, if they're doing, you know, uh, maintenance, all of that stuff, they actually have an internal document that they do, you know, for uh, training for their for their staff. And we also have the director of health services as part of the um, of the coalition as well. And they're all, um, excuse me, they're all, um, she just will not stay down. Um, yes, you know, they, they're they they're an ongoing connection with all of this. You know, we, we have done outreach and education in elementary schools. We've uh, talked, we've gone into high schools. We've done um, the training on um, superintendent days, you know, all of those types of things. Whatever was possible to connect. And at one point, the city school district, I know it's been difficult to actually get, make sure you get the, so they were trying to collect all the blood level data for every student. Um, and at one point, what they were doing is they had to opt out to not uh, have the school district collect that from the county. And then the lawyers got involved. And so that kind of, uh, you know, but maybe maybe you guys will have uh, better, better, uh, better uh, luck with that. Um, because it was important to make sure that, you know, that, that you knew that information because then it helps with IEPs, et cetera. And, and you know, do, do kids want to be connected to that? And then and then going back to your other question about the idea of, of people who were affected. So part of our bylaws that require that anybody who's involved in the coalition in, in a leadership role or in a, on a committee has to either be a part of the affected community, living in the affected community, or their work is directly affected or connected to the community. So for example, I live in one of the high risk zip codes. Um, on their community, different do different things, and you sort of look at it like that. Um, I will say that you know we've had some parents that were involved, but it was tough because, of course, we were meeting at times that might not necessarily be the easiest for families, and yeah. that's a struggle with all types of community intervention stuff. So, thinking about that, you know, is there a way to provide transportation? Is there a place? Is there a way to have meetings in community? And, and that's certainly what was going on in the beginning, you know, with trying to with, with making sure people get information about the ordinance and all of that. There was a lot more of that outreach on a regular basis. When you got, had established meetings, you try to figure stuff out. That was more really about like, you know, where was parking and could people, you know, get to it easily. Um, but uh, we've also had I've also had um, honestly I've had pushback from families who once they kind of got the information that they needed. Um, didn't want their kid to be the, you know, the lead poison kid um, and, you know, didn't want their child to be the poster child. And and we've also had a lot of, you know, everybody wants to have, oh, the lead poison family. And that's not how we operate, quite honestly, you know. I mean, we've had some families involved and, you know, we always have reporters always want to go take me to the house of a lead poison child. And I'm like, right. no, they're, they're not, no, they're not a commodity these are not people you're going to sit there and go and, 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 you know, exploit the tragedy and then figure out what's going on. You know, if we find lead poison kids and we failed, right? So that for us is like, what, what policies and procedures do we have to put in place? So we're not finding lead poison kids. Right. So uh, another question from the group is, um, can you talk about how you've been able to raise funds and, and how you've kept funding streams alive to support this important work over the course of, I'm, I'm guessing about 20 years now, this coalition has been operating. So how has funding worked and, and what streams have you tapped into and how have you managed to, to keep it financially alive? Uh, well, we have definitely ebbed and flowed. And like all things, in some cases, you know, I, I, it feels like we're a victim of our own success. Um, you know, people feel like, oh, you've solved it, you know, um, and uh, it's difficult to keep putting this out. And people are just, I mean, people just, you know, they always want to look at the shiny bright thing that's over there. Um, 
and now actually the numbers are have gotten so low it's we don't see as big a change right and that's also what's sort of what's going on with covid right like it's going to plateau because we're just going to see some stuff and, and it's not going to be such a huge difference and people are going to lose a little bit of interest because that's just how people are so we had funding from insurers to begin with. We had some significant funding from local insurers. Um, we wrote grants. We actually had, uh, uh, you know, our executive directors. I've written grants um, uh, to do uh, from the insurers, from um, uh, local foundations. Uh, we actually uh, have gotten some funding both from Monroe County Department of Public Health and the city of Rochester at various times through their HUD grants because we'll do education and outreach. Um, and and they can they can subcontract to us to be able to do that type of work, and we'll go out there and, and and we also have here in Rochester we have an ad council which is now called Causeway Community Partners, and we started working with them over ten years ago to become one of their community impact projects, and so we've been able to leverage those relationships to help us create educational materials and awareness campaign and get it out there in a way that um, that we would not have that we would not have otherwise. Um, so it's been a hit or miss. I am actually unpaid right now. I have another uh, different job. So I am not a paid representative for the Coalition to Prevent Lead Poisoning. The work I'm just doing right now is all volunteer. Um, and and that has changed over the years and different things have happened. So no, it, it's it's always a struggle. You know, there are, there are no deep pockets, but um, we are, um, uh, it's always a struggle. Let me just leave yeah. it there. <laughs> yeah, that's a, you're you're not alone in that. I've I've definitely been you know keeping a lot of these initiatives alive with with duct tape and and uh, oh, yeah. you know and, and chicken wire and you know you do you do what you can and I I well I commend you guys for for keeping it going regardless of ebbs and flows for 20 years. It's certainly uh, inspiring for us here in Syracuse. So as I said, I try to keep these episodes to about an hour. Or so. I'll give you kind of two last questions. This one again is from uh, members of the Syracuse group. Uh, Monroe County and the Lead Coalition have seen a steep decline in the numbers of children with lead poisoning. What would you say you are most proud of regarding how that decline was fostered through the coalition? Um, and since lead remains an issue, what work do you feel needs to happen to reduce it even further um, to get these numbers even lower? So that, that was two of them. So those are easy. Um, the first is the lead ordinance. You know, really this idea of being able to take policies and procedures, change them in a way um, to really make an impact. And, and as Katrina said, again, third party study that looked at Monroe County, it was two and a half, it was actually 2.6 times faster um, than any other uh, community in New York State. And they actually, in the study, credit the Coalition Prevent Lead Poisoning because, because of the because of the vigilance, right? Because of us actually sitting there asking questions and looking at stuff and making sure that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And yet we're not monitoring people's jobs. I don't want to make it sound like that, but we're asking questions all the time, right? We're working together. Um, and then, uh, and then you know, the, the problem is also awareness, right? Like it, it, and, and, and our, our um, relaxing stuff. And again, same type of thing, you know, when, when, when COVID first came out and they were had, you know, communities comparing, oh, we don't have any COVID there. And I just thought it's because you're not testing. Right. And which is, which is all about the framework of lead. You know, I mean, people go, we only have X amount of lead uh, poison children here. I'm like, uh, what's your, what are your testing rates? Yeah. You know, if you can actually be looking at apples to apples and if your testing rates are the same of what we're seeing and you're seeing great rock on. So the, the struggle is is awareness, and you know we got this thing out of the out of lead and and, and out of or out of gasoline and out of paint in 1978. So why is it still a struggle? And making sure that people know what they can do, and and that it is a lifelong uh, health impact, and that uh, we have to make sure that we are doing what we can to not ingest it in our bodies. Yeah, and how did you guys? You know, what would you say? Uh, for us right now, so we're we're going into the implementation phase. We've we're the well, I mean, hopefully, you know, I, I don't want to count my chickens before their hats, but the vote is on Monday. And as you as you know, we've said in the conversation when I spoke with the coalition, uh, it's important not to get confused that this is the starting line of the marathon ra rather than the finish line. So, how did the coalition hold people accountable and and you know really um, you know? Um, what were your measures for success and how did, how did you drive people to make sure that, that things were happening in, in, in an implementation way after the ordinance had been passed? 
Well, it was the city's job to make sure implementation was happening. It was our job to keep asking, what are you guys doing? What does it look like? What are you seeing? What's happening? Have you got that? Have you got the report yet? What's going on with that? What, is this in, what does this information mean? Why, why are the numbers like this? Um, you know, and part of it, for example, you know, that the, the county collects uh, blood level data based on zip code. And so a zip code that emerged um, actually turned out to be not one of the ones that was a normally a high risk, but it's where a lot of new citizens are settling. Right. You know, a lot of, so that became this thing, like by evaluating the data, you know, what are we looking at? So, um, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's more like that. And then there were, you know, at one point the, the lead ordinance or the, the way the county was funding the city changed because they looked at the data that Katrina was seeing when we saw the passing rate, they're like, oh, we clearly don't need the lead ordinance here. And we're like, no, it's because of lead ordinance, you know? So there was a situation that presented itself um, where they, we knew it was going to be a, a, a struggle. And we said, you need to do a study to make sure that what we know to be true is, is not either, either not happening or is happening. And of course, we were right. And then when they had that data, they, they had to do something else. And I'm not going into the details about it because it was something that they fixed behind the, the scenes. But if they hadn't, we would have been public about it. And we told them that. Right. So, um, and I'm not pointing figures, I'm not saying who it was, but it was just this, I mean, that's one of the ways that the coalition has worked because we have these relationships, we understand what's going on, we know what we're looking at the data, and by, you know, we're not sitting there, you know, <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not, uh, well, I am calling up, and if I see people not following RRP, I do report them, but that's just me, you know? <laughs> There's only a couple of jerks like me driving around town, but I, I will. If you're not following RRP, I will report you. <laughs> yeah, we need we need more of you out there. Believe me, not less. Um, so, final question as we as we wrap up, I, I leave you with the same last question that I gave to Katrina. As Syracuse goes into this, as our coalition um, kind of transforms a little bit and finds new feet and and uh, reinvents itself as this ordinance. Uh, any insights or, or you know, advice or, or uh, lessons from the road that you learn through trial and error that, that could be helpful for Syracuse? Um, well, I guess part of it is understanding that it's doable, right? Like, and your, your model may be different than ours, but it's not an impossible thing to do. And, and also understanding, you know, I think it's super important to acknowledge when, you know, when you achieve something, small things as well as large things. Um, you know, we had a birthday party for our lead ordinance when it turned 10. Um, we actually had a big party at City Hall and, you know, uh, who the hell has a, has a party for a law, but we did. And um, we were the only ones, I mean, the, the city wouldn't have done that and the county wouldn't have done it either. And um, I think it's important to support your partners, keep each other accountable, um, and, um, and understand that this is, this is an amazing thing that you're doing. Um, and it's going to be a thing that, um, is going to, you're in, you're in it for the long haul. Um, however that manifests and you're going to see the, they're going to see the benefits of that. And it, it's an incredible thing that you're doing. I mean, you, you've decided that you're going to actually put children first and make sure they're, you know, keeping themselves safe. And that's a huge deal. And you guys should be, do not underestimate the importance of that. Absolutely. Well, Elizabeth, on that note, thank you so much for, for coming on and sharing your wisdom and everything with us. And thanks to Katrina as well. And uh, perhaps we can do this again. the best, by the way. We're all, you know, it's really, we're, we're, we are so grateful to have people like Katrina. And she always, she always under, undersells herself, but she is really a rock star. Yeah. And as things grow here in Syracuse, I keep thinking that it would be great to do another, uh, well, obviously COVID limits us at the moment, but I really think it'd be great to do a powwow, like do another dinner like we had at the Rise Center or something oh, yeah. where, but we just do, you know, talk, meeting with some of the Rochester people and, you know, maybe have yourself and Katrina and maybe Gary and some of the other folks who've been really in instrumental in this, just come down and let's, let's all break bread and hang out and ask each other questions and share stories and insights. And I think that'd be really cool to do somewhere down the road when, when the world goes back online. Well, actually goes off offline. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go. Sounds lovely. Sounds lovely. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right. really Thank you guys. Take care. Bye-bye.